briefing in English. Today I'll be speaking with Peter Ajus, our newly elected MEP, and we'll be discussing current affairs in Malta and in Europe. Peter, congratulations on your election to the European Parliament. Thanks a lot. It's been a, a very hard struggle getting there. Long campaign for me because I've been in contact with the people, I've been campaigning, I've been uh, tackling the issues for basically since my last election, since my last uh, being a candidate for the election of 2019. But we, we did it. We did it thanks to the support of all the Maltese people, thanks to a great team that was helping me all along, uh, and thanks to a team effort. Because finally, what uh, we achieved on the 9th of June is a, collective, is a collective determination for change in this country. It's not just having three seats in the European Parliament for the Nationalist Party, it's not just Peter Ajus being elected as an MEP, but this is a, a cry for change. This is a, a strong signal for a better Malta, a better Malta, because this is what we are after at the, at the end of the day. And I intend to be using every possible tool that my mandate as an MEP offers to actually further this interest for a better Malta for us and for our children. Um, to start with, how has your life changed now that you're an MEP? Well, maybe very little because uh, I had my base in Brussels because I worked for the European Parliament and the EU institutions for quite a long time. Uh, but of course perspectives have changed. Now, um, my boss is no longer the EU. My boss is the Maltese people. And uh, given that I uh, spoke about a number of issues you know, to the Maltese people about the need to raise environmental standards, about the need to expand youth opportunities, youth funding, about the need to fight for better governance, you know, about, for, about the need for better connectivity for Gozo. I intend to, to push these issues on every single occasion that I get in the European Parliament, in its plenary, in its committees, in the European People's Party. Uh, so my life has changed in the sense that my, my uh, formamentis, my, the setting has changed, is that now I feel laden with this uh, responsibility to deliver results. What, in your opinion, are the key challenges for Malta in Europe? Well, Malta is an island. An island has its... Uh, very particular characteristics and we must make sure that the European Union understands us better. This is our first and foremost challenge as Maltese in Europe. We must secure that Europe, the European Union, before it acts, before it decides on policy areas, understands well the situation in Malta. And this can seem straightforward or easy, but it's not. Because the European Union is made up of 27 different member states, 27 different characteristics, and uh, with member states most of the time sharing a lot of common characteristics. So, so the situation between the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, and possibly the Netherlands, which are all medium-sized countries, which are all uh, knit, well-knit together. So, you know, between... Uh, Poland and Romania, you have a three-hour highway. Between France and Germany, you can have a 50-minute uh, bus, and you're there. It's not, the, it's not the case for Malta, where everything you need to do, you need to either catch a plane or a ferry or, or, or a ship. Um, anything that you need to export or import involves other modes of transport. So we have a particular situation, and we must make sure that the European Union understands our needs and factors them in 
all its decisions. And this is the, the most fundamental job that an MEP has to do um, together with our allies. So we have to build allies all across the board in the European Commission, in the European Council, in the European Parliament itself. Also with like-minded people, because the situation in Malta and Cyprus and Ireland, for instance, uh, could be similar to some extent. So this is the first challenge as Maltese in Europe. Of course, from a policy perspective, you have the, the Green Deal, which represents its challenges because it's affecting all our modes of transport. We have governance, which for Malta has become a headache across the board with corruption, with mismanagement. Uh, being seen in several areas. So this is something we need to raise up and uh, fight and address also at the European level. And then of course you have questions like tax harmonization, where the European Union is moving towards um, a situation where it's not necessarily in the interests of the, of the Maltese way. For instance, in Malta we have our own uh, um, tax model, okay, attracting foreign direct investment, and for instance, certain aspects of tax harmonization, harmonization would require uh, at least a rethinking of, of our ways, and that they are not necessarily in the national interest. And now we're taking a look at a service by Net News. Net News has reported that the government issued over 9 million euros in cheques to foreigners residing in Malta who do not have Maltese citizenship just before the local European Parliament and Council elections that took place earlier this month. Nationalist Party MP Graham Bencini asked the Minister of Finance, Clyde Caruana, to give a breakdown of the nationalities of the 84,361 people who do not have Maltese citizenship and who received a cheque between the 1st of May and 6th June 2024. Graeme Bencini requested the Minister of Finance to give the reason why these cheques were issued. The Minister of Finance replied that the breakdown of nationalities cannot be given because that level of detail is not available. He confirmed that the total amount of cheques issued to people prior to the election who do not have Maltese citizenship is 9,117,605 euros. Graham Bencini said that although Minister Caruana confirmed the total amount of cheques paid to non-Maltese nationals was over 9 million euros, he could not provide an answer why these payments were made to individuals just before the elections who do not have Maltese citizenship. Meanwhile, Nationalist Party MP Graziella attard Previ also asked the Minister of Finance to confirm the national debt for Malta from 2012. Finance Minister Clyde Caruana responded that in 2012 the national debt was 4.9 billion euros. In 2013 it was 5.2 billion euros. In 2014 5.4 billion euros. In 2015 it was 5.6 billion euros. In 2016 and 2017 it was 5.7 billion euros. In 2018 it was 5.9 billion euros. In 2019, it was 5.7 billion euros. In 2020, it was 6.9 billion euros. In 2021, it was 8.2 billion euros. In 2022, it was 8.9 billion euros. And in 2023, the national debt was reported at 9.7 billion euros. What, in your opinion, are the current uh, geopolitical challenges on the European Union? Well, the first and uh, predominating issue 
uh, in the European Parliament, in the European Union right now, is of course the question of security of especially the member states bordering Ukraine and the, the continuing aggression of Russia in Ukraine. So that is, that is the, the question which is kind of conditioning most of the discussions in Brussels. Of course, Malta being on the southern border of the EU and Malta being a neutral member state, we may feel uh, a bit, you know, uh, maybe protected from these, uh, from these questions and, and the challenges. Of course, we must play our role. We must be present. We must uh, also express our solidarity okay, with member states which share the European Union with us, including member states like in the, in the, Balti in the ba Baltics, uh, where you have you know, uh, several member states being a stone throws away from the Russian border. Um, uh, so we must be sensible to this, while at the same time being firm in our values, in, our, in, our, in the Maltese uh, set of values and the, 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 the values of our people, which include neutrality, which is enshrined in our constitution. Um, a second, of course, key characteristic shaping the European Union right now is the relationship with China on one side and the United States on the other side. On the United States you have uh, elections coming up soon. So these are putting under a lot of stress, especially trade relations. So uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to WTO, world commerce, uh, even the role of China, everything is to be, to be seen now in the context of the U United States election and the aftermath to that. Um, this is our current affairs portion uh, in English, which some people follow week after week. Uh, I'd like to speak a bit about the United Kingdom and what are your views as the United Kingdom approaches election? Well, uh, you know, I am... Uh, I had the opportunity of uh, working closely with the UK when I was working for the EU when the UK was a member state and uh, it, felt, uh, it felt very sorry to see the UK deciding to get out of the European Union with the Brexit. Now when it comes to these elections, it seems that the UK is uh, preparing for another alternation of power with the, with the Tories losing a lot of their grip. Uh, after years in government. I hope that uh, this can usher a new, a new stage of collaboration with the European Union. And in the European Parliament, I am also very keen on following closely how the UK-EU relationship evolves, because we know there is this Brexit treaty, right? But uh, a lot depends on its implementation. And Malta is still um, a very keen uh, partner of the UK when it comes to trade, also when it comes to our cultural uh, affinity, our cultural relationship. So I, as an MEP, I will have an eye on the UK-EU trade deals and I will try to facilitate and to also address the deadlocks, the blockages, the, the issues which may present especially to the Maltese trading community when it comes to import and export to the UK. So do you see uh, changes in post-Brexit trade deals? Well, the deal is there, but a lot of it depends on the implementation. So yes, there could be, there could be ways to clarify certain aspects of the deal. There are implementing rules and the European Commission is in charge of uh, applying these implementing rules. And therefore, the European Commission can be also sensibilized or called upon uh, people also by MEPs, you know, to to make sure that certain aspects of this trade deal when it comes to trade tariffs and their implementation and their application and customs rules and all of that, uh, yes, there can be ways to help uh, our trading community when, when, when things can be made clearer and simplified, especially. 
Can we focus on Malta? Malta, the, these last few weeks, with the reduction of the electorate that voted for the Labour Party in Malta, and going forward, the cases, the ongoing cases of corruption. Where are we now? I'd like to update people who watch this in English. Yes, we have uh, an ongoing case uh, in front of the court involving up to 30 key protagonists, including politicians and former politicians. Uh, this is a, an unprecedented phenomenon in Malta where no one has ever been convicted, basically, of corruption so far. Um, uh, to, we need to underline that we got to the state of these accusations, these procedures in court, not thanks to the police, so the police have not uh, done their investigations, they have not brought people in front of the courts, but it was the initiative of an NGO, Republica, and uh, the, uh, the tenacity and the perseveration of a, of a magistrate who has conducted these investigations and brought them to uh, a point where these protagonists are now uh, charged in court. This is, of course, a case which has the potential to change a lot of the unchallenged parameters of the Maltese political system. This, this is a case which, uh, which promises to, to, to bring justice you know, in, in areas and into cases which so far have eluded justice. Of course, we cannot anticipate, we cannot prejudge. We need to let the institutions do their work. We need to maybe refrain from uh, uh, too much political comment because this is finally a technical exercise okay, of assessing proof, of assessing uh, evidence and then coming up to, with, a, with a determination on whether the basics, the basic ingredients of the law are met for a person to be charged with corruption or with fraud or with mismanagement. But of course we are following these cases uh, very closely and uh, everyone should because this this is about the way we we handle taxpayer money because this is what it's all about okay these are we're speaking about 400 million euros of disbursed payments to vitals which is a a contractor which basically was assigned a concession to run three state hospitals and uh, here we're speaking about very hard earned taxpayer money every time you go to uh, you go to buy and you pay VAT every time you pay are paying your income tax every every time you're buying a property and you're bu you're paying duty on documents tax um, all of these are feeding into uh, this huge machine where which is then uh, you know uh, misusing your money and spending it in fraudulent contracts like this so um, we, need, we need to see radical change in Malta in this regard. And I am proud to, to be part of the Nationalist Party, who is the party who can, who can re-establish some equilibrium in this country. You know? There have been uh, Nationalist Party administrations in the past, which did not run you know, as smoothly. I mean, there were cases of mismanagement and corruption, but when compared to this, I mean, these were these were micro cases. This, this, these are, this, here we're speaking about mammoth, mammoth cases of 400 million um, fraudulent contracts. So we must cut a line. We must draw a line, and uh, we should have the courage to work for a better Malta. Okay, and this requires that all of us put our efforts together, and actually put our money where our mouth is. Okay, and support the Nationalist Party, support its protagonists, support its people, and work for change together. And finally for today, what can you tell us about Roberta Metzola being a candidate for the presidency in the European Union? Yes, of course, this week we voted for Roberta to be nominated by the European People's Party as a nominee president of the European Parliament. That vote will take place on the 16th of July. Okay, I am very proud to have supported Roberta in this nomination. And uh, Roberta achieved 100% endorsement 
of the European People's Party, which is a historical achievement. And now we go to the vote in the European Parliament, where we do expect uh, another show of support by all the political groups, because so far it's been the centre-right, okay, the European People's Party. Now on the 16th of July, we will have uh, Roberta uh, is being asked to be supported by all the political groups, which is now it's even harder. But we still expect Roberta Metzola to garner support from across the political spectrum. And this shows the respect that Malta can gather around the table when we put forward competent people with a strong argument. And this makes us all proud and this also underlines our potential. As a Maltese nation, as a Maltese people, when we work together towards a goal, we can achieve. And this is also why I took my seat as member of the European Parliament in your name to further our interests as a Maltese nation, to advance our values, to advance our interests as an island nation with conviction, but also with commitment to European ideals and to the European uh, huge potential for uh, benefits, for prosperity in for Malta and the Gozo. Thank you very much, Peter, for your time today. Grazie a Thank you for watching our current affairs briefing tonight, where we spoke with Peter Adjus, newly elected to the European Parliament. Should you have any questions, any queries, please send them as usual to the number that appears on the screen. I'm Leah Hogg for NET TV.